we're in a study. Uh, we started this last week. It's called Greatness as we are literally exploring one of the greatest chapters in the entire Bible, Romans chapter 8. And I call it greatness because every great theme that we see in Scripture is in Romans 8. Let me tell you, some of, uh, some of you uh, die-hard football fans, we are exactly 95 days from today away from the first game of the 2016 NFL schedule. And uh, it should come so, as no surprise that the people are rather dedicated to their teams, it seems. <laughs> so um, you can appreciate the story that uh, I heard recently from a man in Mansfield, Ohio. He was a Cleveland Browns fan. And, and if you know the NFL and you know the Cleveland Browns, they have never been to the Super Bowl. In fact, they have only twice in the last 20 years even made it to the playoffs. This man passed away. And in his will, he made a final request that six members of the Cleveland Browns football team would serve as his pallbearers because, as he wrote, I would like for them to let me down one last time. <laughs> because many people go to their graves disappointed. Many people leave their grave disappointed. Why do so many people who have been buried with Christ never seem to experience the abundant life that Christ promised? Why, why do so many with that no condemnation status that we talked about last week settle for a no transformation existence? Today I wrestle over a matter that I have struggled with for over 30 years. How can people, for decades, claim a Christian identity and there is no visible evidence that their life has been in any way affected by the claim that Jesus died for them? Now Paul has an answer. And his answer is greatness. But it is blunt and it is controversial. We saw last time that if you are in Christ, you are under no condemnation. No means no. In fact, we said if you preach the gospel the way it's supposed to be preached, people will ask the question, is he saying that it doesn't matter if we sin or not? That's how strong the message of grace and no condemnation should actually be declared. But Paul is going to deal with the issue of sin under grace. And the message is greatness. Romans chapter 8, beginning in the fifth verse. Read this from your own Bible. We read these words. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you 
will live. So here's my question. And write this down. Did you accept Jesus' life as well as his death? Because the New Testament makes it clear that the effect of Jesus' death will affect every life that is united to it. To Paul, it is absolutely impossible to have actually connected to the death of Jesus without tangible, visible expression of new life. Baptism is not just a burial. It is a rebirth. He says the same thing back in the sixth chapter of Romans. Romans 6, beginning in the third verse, you read these words. Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God in the same way. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, if you came in contact with the atonement, Paul says that there is going to be obvious movement. There's going to be something different about you. If you are under no condemnation in Christ, you are going to manifest serious transformation, real transformation like Christ. And this helps me with my struggle. How people that for years and years call themselves Christians and there is no evidence of new life. How can that be? Simple. They are still dead. One of the biggest problems in churches today is that churches are filled with members who are not saved. Because it is easy to be Christian without being saved. You just have to have your parents say when you were a baby, okay, they're Christian now. You just have to go to summer camp one night as a kid and say, I believe in Jesus. You just have to have a nagging mate drag you to church and finally get you to sign a piece of paper. You just have to be born in America. Because, you know, we're a Christian nation and and unless you claim something else, you're a Christian. It is very possible to be Christian and not be saved. Now you need to understand, Paul is not comparing weak Christians to strong Christians. He is comparing people who are dead to people who are alive. And how do you discern who is spiritually dead and who is spiritually alive. You need to understand it is not that complicated to know if someone is spiritually dead or alive. The sure indicator, Paul says, is the indwelling spirit, the presence of Christ in you. Because if someone is alive, then the spirit of Christ gives evidence of that life. Look at Romans chapter 8 again, verse 9, the latter part of the verse. He says, remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. When you come to Christ and you contact his atoning death, something happens. You become a new person. And people notice and they say, what's gotten into you? Paul says, it's not what, it's who. Who has gotten into you? God did not give you his Holy Spirit to put a quiver in your liver. He gave you the Holy Spirit to help you say yes to becoming more like Jesus. And a great life will confess 
the yes. Then you, what does it look like? Paul gives us some clues. Then you are newly alive to the Lord. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. The great life is alive to God, but, but life governed by the flesh is not alive. He says life in the realm of the flesh is dead. It doesn't mean that in the realm of the flesh you are necessarily grossly immoral. He simply means that you are numb to God. Pretty much 24-7 you live your life numb to God. But life in the Spirit is constantly focused on the things of God, how to honor God, how to please God. Those who live in the Spirit have their minds set on what it is that the Spirit desires for their life. William Wilberforce, passionate evangelical leader in England who led the movement to abolish slavery. He was dear friends with a man named William Pitt, who was a brilliant intellect, and he was the prime minister. Pitt. Like if every Englishman of that day was, was Christian in the sense that he was born in England. So that makes you Christian. He had no spiritual life. He had no heart for God. The so Wilberforce kept inviting Pitt to come to church with him. Finally, one Sunday, he actually came. And he heard the great Richard Cecil, a, a powerful evangelical pastor who, who in his sermon lifted up Christ powerfully and he held up the cross. And Wilberforce was just excited the entire time. He was rejoicing inside and he was praying for his friend William Pitt as he was listening to this sermon. As they walked out of the sanctuary, Pitt turns to Wilberforce and he says, Wilberforce, I do not have the slightest clue what that man was talking about because he was dead. You see, when you come to Christ, when you, when you receive life in Christ, God gives you new software to run inside your mind. And the Holy Spirit starts to transform, to literally reprogram your mind. Paul says later in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. When you start to let the life of Christ take over you, your brain, you start to think differently. You start to see life. You start to do life. You start to think life through a, a new lens. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. You don't just think about Jesus. You think like Jesus. When someone becomes a new Christian, there are three things that I always pray for them. First, I pray that they're going to be protected from the evil one because as soon as you enter the kingdom of light, the dominion of darkness slaps a target right on your back. The second thing I pray is I pray that somebody's going to come into their life that is, an, that is an older, wiser, more mature Christian that will mentor and disciple that person. And the third thing I pray is that they will be renewed in their mind, that they will start to experience a completely different way to think. And when you think like Jesus, you are liberated. And it starts with the flesh. Paul says, when you have new life in Christ, you understand, secondly, that you are truly free of the flesh. Now, let me explain that our salvation is not yet complete. Because I am still in this sin-infected body. The seeds of death are in this body. They're in your body. And we are wasting away. You ever notice that? I mean, you can go to a gym. You can have plastic surgery. You can get your hair colored. But you're getting older, and it shows. You don't believe me? Go get a mirror. Go stand in front of a teenager. 
They'll tell you. <laughs> Until we get our, our resurrected bodies, we are going to deal with the, the pull of the flesh. But life in Christ, while not eliminating that pull, it eradicates the power. Do you think Jesus is going to deliver you from the penalty of sin and not also deliver you from its power? Look what he said in Romans chapter 6 again, verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Your new life in Christ, even though it is, it is housed in unredeemed humanity, recognizes a new master. So you no longer have to do what the flesh is trying to compel you to do. The flesh says, obey your thirst. But you don't take orders from the flesh anymore. That phrase in this verse that we should no longer be slaves to sin literally means in the Greek we are no longer in debt to sin. You, you don't owe the flesh anything anymore. And one reason we live puny lives instead of great lives is that we have been duped. Harry Houdini the famous escapologist used to claim, there is no prison cell that I cannot get out of. A little town in Britain built this little prison. They sent a message to Harry Houdini. Our cell is escape proof. Houdini claimed, I'll get out in an hour. So they put him in the cell, they closed the door, and he went to work. He worked for two hours, and he could never trip the lock. In frustration, he quit, and he leaned against the door, and it flew open. They never locked the door. The whole time he thought he was in prison, he wasn't. And neither are you. When you died with Christ, every legal claim that sin ever had against you was satisfied. So you don't have to take orders from the flesh anymore. Look back in chapter 6, verse 12. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Please note, he did not say, don't sin anymore. You can't do that. But you don't have to let sin reign anymore. This absolutely repudiates one of, one of our favorite excuses. That's just who I am. I've always had a bad temper. It runs in my family. I'm just a guy, you know, and, and, and guys, our eyes wander. It's what we do. We're guys. I, I don't let go of things very easy. I, I just have a lot of trouble forgiving people. It's, I'm just wired that way. If you think that you were just born that way, listen, you have been born again. You have received new life in Christ. And the flesh doesn't have the power or the permission to tell you what to do anymore. And please understand, saying no to sin is not the way to get justified. Saying no to sin is the evidence that you have been justified. You can say no now because you are in Christ and there is no condemnation and you have received new life to be able to do what you could never do before. The faith in Christ that made peace with God is going to make war on sin in your life. Now please hear me, I'm not saying that you are saved by grace and then you turn over to grit and try to, to do your best to become holy. You cannot win the battle against the flesh in the flesh. Paul said, if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You see, you are fully victorious 
in the Spirit. We, we said last time that you come to Christ when you do that, and His righteousness is imputed to you, but it is also imparted to you. And now you're under no obligation to the flesh. You're under an obligation to, to live out this righteousness that has been imputed and imparted to you that Christ, He's literally poured into you. And it doesn't happen by lists or laws. Don't go back to the old way of law. The flesh can only produce temporary behavior modification. I think about this every so often when we, we see these tragedies. We've seen it from time to time. It's happened where there's some sea park, like SeaWorld, and, and a killer whale kills one of its trainers in the water. It happened last time in 2010. We see a story like that, we're, we're stunned because that whale has been trained over and over its whole life. And we're shocked that a killer whale killed. That's its nature. By the way, I think that, that gorillas have a similar nature. You, you can train all you want, but there will be moments when its nature will find an expression. So Paul says, you, you don't train the flesh. It needs to be slayed in the spirit. Look what he writes in Galatians chapter 5. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature, the flesh, with its passions and desires. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. You are not able to live for God unless you live from God. God, unless you allow the Spirit of God to lead you into this new life that you now have, and the Spirit will lead you into holiness, not so that you can be saved, but because you are saved. The Spirit will nudge you to do the right thing, even when it is unpopular, even when it is costly. Sometimes the Spirit will ask you to stand, and no one else is standing. So that Christ is glorified, so that His truth is lifted up. The Spirit will convict you when you are about to do the wrong thing. The Spirit will increase your hunger for God, wanting you to, to pray more, to be with God's people, wanting to digest His Word. The Holy Spirit will, will call to mind those scriptures for those sword moments. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, and you're in a moment, and you need a word. And suddenly, the Spirit will, will prompt that scripture in your mind, and you will speak in that moment. The Holy Spirit will just guide your mind more regularly to the things of God. Now, we've all seen Christmas trees. We've all seen fruit trees. And at first glance, both of them are very pretty. The Christmas tree is decorated with all kinds of shiny baubles. But there's just one thing. It's, it's completely dead. And at some point, deadness will overwhelm everything else. The fruit tree is alive. And that fruit is produced naturally, regularly, continually, because life is coming from in that tree. And Paul says we get our life from the Spirit, so we should follow the Spirit. And one thing that I've learned about people who are filled with the Spirit, they don't have to go around telling everybody that they're filled with the Spirit. You just look at their life. The late 1980s, Ronald Reagan was finishing his second term as president. George H.W. Bush was vice president, and he was running and winning the nomination for the Republican Party. Democrats were having a big campaign. Senator Gary Hart was the leader for the Democratic nomination until there were reports that he had had an extramarital affair. Well, he challenged the media. He said, well, just follow me and see if it's true. They did, and it was. 
and his campaign imploded once he was caught with a young woman named Donna Rice. Donna Rice was raised to know the Lord. She did. She went off to college and she started dating boys that did not know the Lord. In fact, she said, you know, I made a bad step here and I made a, a compromise over there and a series of decisions later and I wound up in a place wondering, how did I ever get here? And she'll tell you, even when I was with Senator Hart, the Holy Spirit was telling me, don't go there. Today, her name is Donna Rice Hughes. She leads a ministry called Enough is Enough. It's a ministry that helps young people, especially girls, to be aware and protected from the dangers of internet pornography. Donna Rice Hughes is now a champion for purity because she, she stepped into the life that was always there for her, but she had been denying. So listen, as, as, as your pastor, I, I have to ask you genuinely a very hard question. Are you dead or alive? You might think, well, I wouldn't be here if I was dead. It is quite possible to be a member of a church and be dead. All of us in Christ have the Holy Spirit. But does the Holy Spirit have all of us? He has some of you. I mean, some of you are living the great life. You're, you're living an abundant life. And, and I'm not saying that you don't have trials, but even in the midst of trials, there's just God everywhere. I think some of you are alive, but asleep. You have learned how to quench the Spirit so effectively that you live most of your week numb to God. And yet, I, I know you're alive because every now and then, deep down inside, you feel that nudge. And you know God is calling you to more than what you have actually settled for in your life. And what you need to do is you need to repent. Jesus said, repent, the kingdom is here. And that is not a rebuke, that is an invitation. He's saying, don't settle, don't settle for life that's natural, when I'm trying to offer you supernatural life. Some of you are dead. And you know what the problem is? If, if, if you're dead, you can't even understand what I am saying apart from the miracle work of God to open up your ears to His truth. So I'm going to pray that that happens for you right now. 